Hello, and welcome to A Matter of Liberation, a lecture by James King. Um, this has been uh, long in the making and long in the works. It's re prison renaissance and the Thatcher Gallery have been collaborating for a couple of years on a series of uh, installations and shows uh, that started in August with a talk with incarcerated and formerly uh, incarcerated artwork and artists about what liberation means from our perspective. And today, James King is gonna to talk to you about some concrete steps we can take towards liberation. Um, before we get into that, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, one way to look at liberation, and I wanna talk a little bit about who James King is in the form of a story uh, that I like to tell about him. Um, so as to liberation, we have a lot of definitions for what that is, but I think that I'm really concerned with analysis of, pow of power because liberation isn't ultimately about power and who has it and who does not have it and, and what is the justness of that. And so one way that I would like you to think about liberation as you listen to uh, James's talk is, um, Liberation is the, uh, the identification of the consolidation of power in unjust ways, followed by the redistribution of that power. And I want you to always challenge yourself and I want you to find ways, I want you to challenge yourself to demand that when we're talking about liberation and when you are committing liberatory actions that there is a redistribution of power involved. Because if liberation is not about, if liberation is about power and we don't see power moving, then we are not talking about liberation, We're talking about something else and who knows what it is, but it was, would not be liberation. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about James. Um, so me and James knew each other for a while in San Quentin where we were both incarcerated. Uh, James organized in prison, I organized in prison. Um, but I want to tell you a, something that um, was really extraordinary about James, and that is this. Um, he was organizing a group of men in prison. Um, and uh, to know the, what he accomplished, you first have to know something about prison, and that is one, it is a deeply homophobic, transphobic place. Um, and I remember a couple years ago, uh, like word got to me that a James group inside that he was organizing was organizing with uh, transgender activists inside. And before I heard that statement, I would have told you that was impossible because that is the level of homophobia and transphobia that exists in prison that people who are not transgender uh, generally do not do not like associate with transgender people, uh, not in healthy ways. Um, and so what you what I the reason I tell the story is I want you to understand what it takes to do that. What it takes to do that is a level of trust building that I can't describe for you because you don't understand how homophobic and transphobic prison is. But suffice to say, I would have said it was impossible. And this is something that James did. And I note that he did it. Like one thing that differs between me and James's style is he's like very patient and he takes his time. And he took his time with these men and built trust with these men in such a way that they would risk the, the consequences and that related to in prison politics to, um, to organize like we all should be organizing and that is with everyone who has everything in common with us against what we are trying to end. And so that is a powerful skill. That is a skill that is, um, that is a skill so lacking in movement in general and is so needed I cannot overstate how um, superhuman, for lack of a better word, 
James's skill in building trust in communities is as evident by that by by this event, this like historical event in prison. So I just want to share that to share a little bit with you about James. Uh, and I'm going to step back and I'm going to turn it over here over to him to talk. Um, we are accepting questions from you in the question and answer section of this of this Google. So if you have questions, please put it there rather than in the chat. And when James is finished talking, me and James will talk about your questions and we'll just have a conversation about uh, the questions that you give us as a uh, fertile seed. Um, thank you for coming. With no further ado, James King. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> I'd like to begin by, by thanking Antoine Williams, Gloria Simmons, Neil Herbert, Victoria Farlow, Shana Hamerman, all of the organizers from Prison Renaissance and Thatcher Gallery for this event. Um, also Emil, whose who's brilliance and passion for community uplift I've long admired. Um, it's a little surreal that I'm here speaking with you today. My commitment to abolition as a form of social justice relatively new. I grew up in Ferguson, Missouri, a suburb of St. Louis that would later become the epicenter of the rebirth of resistance towards state militarized violence against its largely black citizenship. Truth be told, I can't remember a time when I did not become hyper alert and anxious whenever a police car or officer was in my vicinity. There were problems in my home, I began acting out in the neighborhood at a fairly young age. And by then, policing was a normalized part of my experience. It didn't seem at all odd to me that if a young 11-year-old boy shoplifts a candy bar, the response by the government would be to send a person with a gun to apprehend him. In fact, all around me in the media were messages that police officers were heroes who protected society from people who broke the law can't quite remember it, but there must have been a time when my own father's nervousness around police also became apparent to me and caused me to wonder if that meant he was on the wrong side of the law. He wasn't. Both my parents worked 40 hours per week at the post office, quietly living the middle class dream of buying a home, living in suburbia, saving for retirement. Back then, and perhaps even in certain pockets of the country today, there was a hope that being middle class could protect the person from the stigma of being black in this nation. For me, that wasn't the case. When I went off into my neighborhood, the store owners and local police did not see a middle class, a middle class kid with a few problems at home who was prone to act out sometimes. They saw a young black male who was well on his way to being a criminal and menace to society. As a teenager, I was stopped at gunpoint by police on multiple occasions, placed in lineups, treated like the criminal most people assumed I'd become. And all around me, young black men were having similar experiences. My friends and I used to joke that the police motto to protect and serve mean they protected them by serving us. The perspective we held was not one we arrived at by accident. In fact, every social structure we interacted with including school, language, various forms of media, and even art we were exposed to reinforced our understanding of our place in society. It was these conditions and more that later in life caused me to begin to question the necessity of policing as a means of creating safety in our society. I'll never forget sitting in a prison cell in San Quentin, watching my community in Ferguson rise up not just against the militarized police who tormented me as a teenager, but rising up against the very notion that police were on the side of justice at all. That moment led me on a journey of realization that the concepts of liberty and freedom from policing and incarceration were not ones to be fought on the moral landscapes of guilt and innocence, but instead on the grounds of equity and safety. And though my experience is common to many segments of our nation's population, I'm sure there are many people listening to my remarks today who had a quite different experience growing up. Perhaps, as I've heard some say, the police were invisible to them. Perhaps if they thought about police at all, they were sources of comfort and, 
help produce feelings of security. That's because if you live in America, your quality of life as determined by access to affordable housing, a well-stocked refrigerator, medical care, race and a normalized lifestyle is enforced and protected by state violence. State violence is largely invisible to those it is protecting while ever present to those it is oppressing and harming. This year, I was struck by the broadness of the actions that we label violence. Over the course of eight minutes and 46 seconds, police officer Derek Chauvin casually murdered George Floyd in front of a crowd while a camera captured it all. When people took to the streets out of anger and frustration, broke windows or took property in response, that was called violence too. All summer, we've watched as the media and our political leaders conflated violence against black people with property damage and labeled it all violence. To further complicate matters, black people themselves have been treated as property by rule of law, which was then enforced by our system of law enforcement for hundreds of years. And though many will say times have changed, I'd remind them that when Michael Brown was killed by police officers, the defense in the media was that he'd shoplifted earlier that day. When Eric Garner was killed by police officers, their defense in the media was that he'd been selling untaxed cigarettes and in the recent grand jury convening regarding the murder of Breonna Taylor, an indictment was put forth for an officer shooting a wall, but not for shooting a person. As a result, people who have never had to think much about policing are becoming educated about these so-called abuses of power. I worry, however, that perhaps we're missing the big picture. The incidents of unprovoked violence and murder by police officers are not due to individual abuses by corrupt police officers. Instead, we must ask, if we are to call them corrupt, what exactly is corrupting them? In America, we've created a system in which we have authorized people to carry lethal weapons and enforce property rights, traffic laws, domestic disputes, the very subjectivity of our nation's laws. Uh, at times in our history, police have enforced the right to own slaves and the right of men to abuse their wives and ch children. Even today, separating a mother from her children can either be a violation of the law or a means of enforcing it, depending upon the context. Truth be told, the system of law enforcement we have is inherently violent. And if that's true, then these acts of murder and violence by police officers are not the result of corruption, but just evidence of human, humanity's inability to objectively be violent in ways that are socially approved. As I learned in dealing with my own harmful ways of dealing with trauma in my own life, no one is born violent. Instead, small acts of harm escalate into larger ones as a means of trying to process pain in one's own life. And just about every aspect of policing is violent when you think about it. Showing up at someone's house with a gun, that's violent. Placing someone in handcuffs, restraining them, holding them against their will, taking them to jail are all forms of state violence. We can debate the usefulness of, but should still re recognize as acts of state violence by people authorized to commit that violence. For those of you who consider yourselves academic allies of Black Lives Matter, sympathizers to the movement for black lives, I want to encourage you to recognize your potential to be more than allies. If our legal system and law enforcement system is protecting the status quo, then, and you are benefiting from that protection, then you are impacted. We need for you to use your tools and resources to help dismantle this oppressive system. But it's not your leadership we need, it's your labor. The system we have currently was not built overnight and it will take deep, broad coalitions of various sectors of our society to dismantle it, create a more equitable system in its place. I have no doubt we can do it. We consider ourselves to be highly evolved and sophisticated in our thinking, yet chipmunks have been able to survive for thousands of years without putting other chipmunks in cages. All around us are examples of what social structures can look like in a world 
without armed violence and captivity. Though I'm not convinced we can effectively use the tools of our democracy to fashion a more equitable society, I must concede that we have never, as a, as a nation, truly committed to that cause. Earlier this year, I heard a politician say that the greatest tool we as citizens have is the right to vote. As a friend of mine would say, that's bull. The systems we have created are too entrenched to be dismantled and replaced merely by voting. As people are receiving their ballots in the mail, I'd ask you to look at them and ask a simple question. Who determined these choices before us? Who did the work to get these propositions on the ballot? Who determined who the candidates would be? And how can you engage and influence the process in the future? In 2017, a friend of mine named Rasan Thomas put forward an idea that people should be able to vote regardless of their incarceration status. Organizers he was in community with who were non-incarcerated and had access to more resources began holding meetings with their neighbors to promote the idea. They eventually mobilized, met with state legislators, asking them to support voting for the right to vote to be placed on the ballot. They phone banked, conducted social media campaigns, organized rallies, all in coordination with currently and formerly incarcerated people who were directly affected by the state's policy of not allowing incarcerated people to vote. Due to the imagination of directly impacted people and the labor of less directly impacted people, Californians will be able to vote for a version of Rasan's idea this November 3rd. It's Prop 17, please vote yes. As a brief aside, we have at least two tasks before us. One is dismantling the current systems of oppression and harm. Where abolition has succeeded the most, I believe, is in developing language and awareness that brings clarity to the problems of anti-Blackness, systems of racial orientation and gender oppression, and using punishment, violence, and captivity as a means of social control. What we could use more of, I believe, is language and imagination about how to build a more just world. So I ask, if you benefit from our current social structures, my call to you is that you do the work of dismantling it. Those who are directly impacted are best positioned to imagine a more inclusive future and lead us towards a society that works for the many and not just the few. None of the current structures nor institutions we have are immutable. California has the fifth largest economy in the world. We also have the fourth largest incarceration rate in the world. It falls to all of us to resist the complicity that comes from complacency, to understand that there is something better than having decent housing for yourself while some of your neighbors lack housing, that we do not have to live in a zero sum world where abundance for some comes at the expense of scarcity for most. We do not have to live in a world where we cherish freedom and opportunity for ourselves while looking suspiciously at others who want the same. Let's all do our part to dismantle the structures that are causing harm, strive to create a, a society that abolishes any system that oppresses people in place of supporting people. Thank you. Thank you, James, for that. Um, those words, it's very powerful. Um, I'm Glory Simmons, um, the director of the Thatcher Gallery at the University of San Francisco. And um, I, along with my colleagues, have had the um, good fortune of working with Emil and Antoine, the curator of the exhibition, and um, all of the community members that they brought um, and introduced to us, and we're just so grateful for that. So um, thank you, James and Emil, for being here tonight. And thank you to um, everybody out there for being here as well. Um, James, there was so much in what you just said, but um, one of the phrases that's really sticking with me is complicity and complacency. Um, I'm really going to think more about that and also um, encourage everyone to um, take to heart 
the, the things that you have said about examining the system closer and considering the possibilities of um, building something that is more just in our system. Um, and again, thank you, Emil, for all of your leadership uh, through this uh, collaboration. It's been a pleasure and I've learned so much and um, really just uh, commend you for um, the way in which I think you really have shown the way um, that prison renaissance um, brings artists and thinkers to the communities who need them, including all of us today. So thank you for that. As I continue with um, acknowledgements and reminders, I encourage everyone to begin posting your questions for James and Emil in the Q&A and continue using the chat to connect. Um, we really wanna hear from you. Meanwhile, I wanna thank um, so many people and I'll start with the gallery staff, Nell Herbert and Victoria Farlow, as well as our student staff, Andrea Gonzalez, Summer Taylor, and Shannon Foley. I also wanna give a shout out to Amy Dowling, Shana Hammerman, and especially our exhibition curator, Antoine Bakes Williams. Without all of them, this event and exhibition would not be possible. Thank you to the Jesuit Foundation for supporting this particular um, event. We are so grateful for your support. Um, just so you know, all of the events uh, that we have had in conjunction with our exhibition can be viewed on the gallery's YouTube channel. Don't miss the online exhibition, A Matter of Liberation, Artwork from Prison Renaissance. Um, it's featured on the gallery website through November 6th. And we will be offering a public tour at 12 noon on Thursday, October 22nd, and a link will be available in the chat. In two weeks, we have the pleasure of bringing the co-founders of the award-winning podcast from San Quentin State Prison, Ear Hustle, um, to, to you. So please join us for that. Um, Antoine Banks-Williams, Erlon Woods, and Nigel Poor will be in conversation with USF Media Studies Professor Ina Arzumanova. Um, now it's with pleasure that I turn this back to Emil and James to continue this conversation. All right. Ah, we have some questions and some answers. Well, hopefully some answers. So we have uh, a question. I am curious why you both think there are so few prison abolitionists that are incarcerated. Um, James, you're the guest of honor, so <laughs> proceed first. <laughs> you know, um, yeah, I, at first I just want to start by naming that that's a fact. Uh, um, while we were at San Quentin, um, just saying while inside that, that those cages that maybe prison shouldn't exist um, was considered extremely radical. Um, a lot of people, um, and, and I think that, that I've always thought that it's, it, it's come from the lessons that were internalized in people um, throughout their, their childhood and histories and growing up. Um, I, and I'll speak for myself. Um, you know, as a kid, when, when I act out, acted out, the response by my parents was, was typically one of punishment. So I, I started to internalize a system in which if I acted in certain ways, I would be rewarded or, or at the very least left alone. And if I acted in, in ways that crossed boundaries, I'd receive punishment for that. So for a long time, in my imagination, that was justice and, and that was how, um, what justice could and should look like. It wasn't until I began to unpack lessons from my own life as to why I'd acted like in some of the harmful ways that I'd acted and also saw that to be true for so many people who were around me that I began to realize that um, 
the response to to harm and, and to behavior that was like against society was not punishment that that furthered the the whatever the underlying things were that was causing the behavior in the first place but instead was was a more nurturing and, and more supportive and and um an understanding approach it was then that i began to realize that my concepts of, of what justice would look like and should look like were were completely misguided and, and i think that in a nutshell when your entire life you've been punished for so-called wrongdoing, regardless of who said it was wrong, then it's hard to imagine a world in which that foundation is not um, the right one. Your thoughts, Emil? Uh, I have a lot of thoughts on this. I'm gonna to try to contain them a little bit, um, but I'll, I say often that um, in order to get out of prison, I had to become a white supremacist. And when you think about getting out of prison for someone who serves a life sentence, in my case, the governor commuted my sentence. Um, so the governor doesn't commute the sentence of someone who is saying something is wrong with the system on which legit on which your power rests, right? So he commutes my system, so my, 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 my sentence. Then I go to the parole board. The parole board is not going to release anyone back into the streets and says, this system in which your power rests is illegitimate. You are illegitimate. So in order to get both a commutation and, and to get paroled by a parole board, you must convey that there's legitimacy to this system that has you incarcerated. Now let's think about that system. So we don't really need a big conversation to um, all of us acknowledge that the criminal justice system is racist. Now let's think about what racism means, what racism is, right? I feel like racism is kind of a misnomer. It points us in the wrong direction because racism is a means to an end and it's the end that's, that's, that's most relevant, more so than the means, in the same way that you wouldn't say, hey, let's deconstruct this house. OK, let's talk hammers. No, you talk house. You don't talk, <laughs> you don't talk about the hammers. You don't talk about the qualities of a hammer. So racism is a tool to achieve white supremacy. Um, Anti-Semitism is a tool to achieve white supremacy. Prisons are a tool to maintain white supremacy. So what we're talking about when we say this system is racist is that it is a white supremacist system. Back to getting out of prison. I got out through a commutation and parole. But any road out of prison in general involves a validation of a white supremacist system, which means you are engaging in a the perpetuation of white supremacy is a white supremacist practice. And the distinction between practicing white supremacy and being a white supremacist is academic and not that helpful. So to roll that up in like a little ball, I had to practice white supremacy to get out of prison. And we can talk about like the details of what that looks like in another question if someone's interested. Um, but what that means is there's three kinds of people in prison, right? There's more than three, but for simplicity's sake, there's three kinds of people practicing white supremacy to get out of prison. Um, and there's three kinds of people encountering rehabilitation programs, which is about teaching you to succeed in society. But if society is racist, if society is white supremacist, it's teaching you how to get along in a white supremacist society. And given that, in order not to get crushed and incarcerated in the society, you can't, your, your game plan can't be, I'm just gonna like resist and destroy society. Rehabilitation is itself too, a re-education process of teaching people how to be white supremacists. Um, so three things can happen. 
you can practice it and hold the dissonance of I'm doing this thing, but this isn't me. And to varying degrees of success, people hold that dissonance. Uh, no one holds it and, and goes unscathed. No one holds it and doesn't internalize something because we're human beings, right? Um, there are people who cannot hold that dissonance. And so the, the practice and the person collapse into one and you become a performance. Um, and then there are people who, for some reason, whether it's like consciously or subconsciously, they sense that they cannot hold that dissonance. And so they do not try. And those are the people who we say, oh, like they're not doing, they're not doing the right thing because they're not in rehabilitation programs. They play dominoes all day. Or they do, what they do is they have made a decision that I will, I would rather be in prison than, than to commit spiritual suicide. Because if you can't hold the dissonance, that's in essence what you're doing. And so you have people who, um, who must perform it, and you have people who have tried to perform it and can no longer perform it, and so they have become it because they have internalized it. And within those two groups, the narrative that's, that is acceptable to white society is we need prisons. The narratives that are acceptable to white society is that if you're in prison, you belong in prison. And so to get out of prison, that is the expression you get from most people in prison. And there's this mechanic of how this works when you think about like white supremacy. White supremacy always pretends to justice, right? Like it gathers evidence that it's doing the right thing. And in this case, uh, you may have heard people say, well, I know a person who's incarcerated and he says this, right? And it's like, I know a person who's incarcerated and says we need prisons. And that's like one more way why supremacy uh, perpetuates itself. So I think that's why a lot of people uh, in prison aren't abolitionists because uh, there isn't space to be an abolitionist and to survive. Um, and because there isn't space, there often isn't imagination for it. There aren't alternatives. There aren't, there, there's not another conversation people can have because all of the conversations that are about abolition often need to be had in secret when you're in prison. You know, I want to, I, I saw a couple of comments about it in the, in the uh, Q&A in the chat that I, that I wanted to um, speak to as well. One of the, the uh, professors, one of my professors, uh, uh, Jennifer Fisher, comments that that often um, in her philosophy classes, students um, kind of like promoted this narrative of, of of individual accountability because anything else would less would be minimizing. And, and two of the things that I want to highlight and in, in put forward in that is first. Um, I think for, for most people, visitors who go into a prison, it might be surprising for them to realize that what you are genu genuinely seeing is not people's most honest, trusting, vulnerable selves. Um, they, uh, um, just as people out here in, in society wear masks and, and are not always completely vulnerable at all times, that's um, also true for people in prison who have been and are currently being subjected to a level of state violence that um, is quite graphic and hard to describe if you've never been um, uh, stripped naked at gunpoint, for instance, or, or handcuffed and thrown in a cage, or forced and compelled to lock yourself in a cage day after day after day. Um, because if you don't lock yourself in that cage, then someone's going to come and do it to you by force and may isolate you for decades. Um, and so in that type of environment, as people come in, you may not, um, the answers you get may be an attempt at vulnerability. They may not be. Um, what they will not be is that person apart from the state violence that they are currently experiencing, even when you can't see it. Um, it's present. 
if you're being held against your will. Secondly, um, when you're immersed in, a, in an environment that um, has made it, it its complete endeavor to, um, to objectify you, to, to um, minimize your humanity. And I don't like saying that prisons dehumanize or, or dehumanizing. I think that's um, not accurate. I think humans are the only species on the planet that actually puts other species in cages. And so prisons and incarceration and all these things are extremely human. Um, um, and so when we see all of these violent activities that we as humans are engaging in towards other violent humans, and that includes like having to wear clothes that, that label you prisoner. That includes rules that you are not allowed to, to um, challenge authority in any way. Um, and that every aspect of your life is governed and, and um, controlled by that, that violence, then um, it's really hard to, to hold a, a purely theoretical um, value. It just, it, 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 I agree with Emil that it's, um, because if you hold that value and you then don't live by that, what are you, what is your message to yourself? Um, like I know one person, I know of one person, though there are many, but one very famous example um, is George Jackson who, who um, decided that he wanted freedom at all costs. Um, and, and I think that that um, to be abolitionist in prison, to be um, to recognize that this is not a question of who deserves what or, or accountability, because you can't talk about individual accountability without talking about the state's accountability for the conditions that that created the the pain and trauma in our lives in the first place, is to then be um, to then. Um, it leads you to some inevitable conclusions that are extremely hard to reconcile. I'll pause there. So I'm going to combine, um, I want to combine two questions because like they're really related. Uh, so the first question is, do either of you panelists have recommendations for study and action groups or volunteering opportunities to help those of us who want to become change makers? And I'm going to focus on the, the, the study. I can't tell if it's my um, internet that, oh, that answer. Um, um, and the other question says, uh, so often we think of our duty to action and participation, participation around obvious parts of the system like police reform. Can you speak to me, can you speak to some of the ways in your experience that the system permeates our society and other areas such as schools? I recently, thanks to Zoom, became aware that my children were learning a proofreading mnemonic called the COPS on the grammar, capitalization, organization, punctuation, spelling. Needless to say, the principal and every teacher my children have had at the school received a lengthy email from me and we are working to change this piece locally then more widely. So to answer Kelly's question, which is going to segue into the earlier question, uh, where else does it permeate? The answer is everywhere. And that is part of the challenge um, we're up against is um, colonialism as a practice was the elimination of like all of the competing ideas. And that wasn't, they, they didn't, and, col and colonialists didn't 100% effectively do it, but they did effectively do it to the point where uh, our, most people's only model of power, even advocates, even activists, is colonialism. And we find ourselves in positions where we're trying to dismantle colonialism and white supremacy using white supremacist tools, which is not something that can be done successfully. Um, and so when you think about like, hey, uh, what can I read 
and even even more largely like what kind of group can I join? I think that because we have what Adrian Marie Brown would describe as an imagination problem, um, what we have to be asking is how do we do things differently? So for instance, a book is print, right? Print culture is a Western, is, is, a, is a Western culture, right? You think about anything that's in print, it went through a publisher, it went through a very particular gatekeeper, and who are those gatekeepers? But people who have the most to gain from the continuance of white supremacy and have the most to lose by the ending of it. So to think that I'm gonna find the answer to ending white supremacy in a book gatekept by a white supremacist society isn't realistic, right? What we need to be like, in answer to your question, what we have to do is think about new ways of learning and new ways of communication. Like you gotta come here and you gotta hear it. We gotta be in conversation with the people, with the communion, with the people on the ground doing the work and, they ha and, and, they're, and they're having the experiences, they're having the integrity and they're having the vulnerability to express their struggle and their uncertainty and this road that we're mapping out as we walk it. Um, and to answer the question of like, what group should I join? It's like, no, I think the thing is, what group can you start, right? What group can you start that uh, has a goal uh, consistent with ending white supremacy and how do you identify in this group how this group differs from all the other groups you've ever known or been a part of? Because chances are, without intention, that without deep intentionality around like how do we make something different, we're not making actually something different. So you got to start your own group first of all. Um, there's like uh, there's seventy some people, seventy seven people in this event. Uh, that you can uh, contact and and network and see if you can start it with them. Um, you gotta move away from the idea that like the answers, the knowledge and the wisdom that you seek is in a book somewhere. Right? We had this joke in prison, like when we argue about something, right? Whether it's definitions, whether it's a word, we'd be like, ah, ah, wait, wait, wait. Let me see what the white man has to say. And we'd grab a dictionary or an encyclopedia, right? And that was like a joke we would tell each other about like, how is it that we've come to be a culture and a people that have our realities defined by people and institutions that do not really have our interests at heart? Um, uh, how is it that there's gonna be knowledge in a dictionary that's somehow more authoritative than the knowledge in our lives? And so by extension, I think that it's a mistake to look for uh, the book, the speaker, the group that's going to be the authority in your life, because there's a way in which, and this is related to, the, to a conversation that many of us are familiar with, and I, and I ask you to transfer the principles of like the conclusions of the scenario to what you're doing, and that is like, uh, white people who want to become more educated on white supremacy and like racial oppression, uh, turning to their black friends to educate them. Now, we all know that's problematic uh, if it's not done consensually. Um, and we all know that the biggest red flag in that is like, hey, there's work that like you need to do, right? There's, there, there, there's, there's, there's soul searching that you need to do and things you need to figure out that white people need to figure out right, because it's a problem created by white people and a problem that's sustaining the privilege of white people. So that's your responsibility, not your black friends, right? And in the same instance, if you are deeply passionate about this idea that, hey, this world is unjust and I wanna know how to change it. And I feel like I have some, I've been in my life, I can see how I've had some complicity in it or I can see how I greatly benefit from it. That is work that you need to do not work that some author needs to do, not work that a group, uh, a group that, that we need to do or that we can recommend a place for you to go to do. That's like, you gotta sit down and put the same effort into that that you put in your, into your everyday work and that's hard to do, that's stressful. Like that's not the path of least resistance and so many people will fall out. But what you gotta think about is if you can't do that, one must question 
if you um, have the tools to dismantle white supremacy, which is a thing that Webbs has been created over several centuries, <laughs> if not millennia. Uh, and I hope that doesn't like deflate sales and be like, well, it's hopeless then, it's got too much work. It's not hopeless, but it does start with a reorientation of how we produce knowledge and how we produce things and how we produce outcomes and how we get things done. And it's that first step that's going to open up the door for life changing and society changing conversations, ideas, strategies, and tactics. There's a, a, a really old, really famous joke that, that, that comes to mind for me where a person says, a uh, um, group of guys were beating me up and, and Frank, Frank Sinatra saved my life. Another person says, really, how do you do that? He said, that's enough. Um, the joke being, of course, that Frank had directed the people who were, were, were beating the lives. And just by taking his hand off of the, uh, or stopping the violence, that he was somehow um, saving someone or working against it. And, and that joke comes to mind as, as I think of the notion, really, uh, uh, and, and the language around volunteering and charity, particularly as it, as it pertains to American systems of white supremacy and, and, and uh, heteropatriarchy. Um, I think that, that, I think of white supremacy in terms of a, let's say for instance, a football game where there are two sides working against each other. You're on either on the white supremacist team or, um, in various times playing offense or defense, or you're on the other team and you're working against it. What there are not, however, are sidelines. Um, there's no sideline. If you are in this country, participating in this country, benefiting from this, from the, the status quo in this country, where you can just kind of like sit off to the sidelines, wait, and then if you see an opportunity to kind of like help one team, go volunteer to help, and then when it's not con conducive to your convenience or whatever, just go back onto the sidelines. Um, that is not what it means to be a citizen in community. Um, what it means it, it, to be a citizen in community is to develop a system of values. Um, and either those values perpetuate white supremacy, heteropatriarchy, and, and a cis world where where things that are, are determined to be different from that are marginalized, disenfranchised, and actually oppressed and harmed, or you, you develop values that, that center around um, creating a more inclusive society that um, shares resources and, and sees commonality in all people, regardless of gender, orientation, race, class, or whatever social constructs we can think of. If the latter is your, your set of, of values and, and the types of values that you want to organize your life around, then um, I would challenge not to think about volunteering as a way to um, promote those values. Um, because while some on the more, more um, liberal side, for lack of a better term, I don't think any of it's liberal or progressive, but, but for some who are on that side of those values, while they're volunteering, the, the systems of oppression are hard at work. Um, and I think that, as I said in my comments earlier, like I just really want to challenge each of us to think about our values, think about how we can dig a little bit deeper in putting in the work to dismantle um, systems that don't align with our values. Um, I agree with, with, with um, Emil that, that um, it's very much about putting in the work. And, and what that looks like is um, if you are, are in spaces and communities where there is, where people are benefiting from white supremacy and heteropatriarchy, then begin to educate your, your um, 
those who are around you. Begin to, to seek the leadership of people who are directly impacted by the systems you wish to challenge. Um, and then follow them, ask them and, and provide the labor. Um, share your resources and in, in, in power. Um, I think that Emil started this off by, by saying any conversation about liberty or white supremacy that does not address power is, is um, not a productive one. And, and I couldn't agree more. So think about how power shows up in your life and think about how you can subjugate that power to leadership other than your own. Um, find the people who are near you in community with you that, that and, and you know, if someone's in your, your, on your block and on your street and in your neighborhood and you've never spoken to them a, a time in your life, you've never seen them, doesn't matter, you're still in community with them. Uh, um, and so start to, to look for spaces where um, the priority is for people and organizations that are, are combating anti-Blackness, that are lifting up uh, uh, um, Blacks, Indigenous, and other people of colors, that are, are working to create a world that is not normative um, because I think it's time we recognize and realize that normal is not a thing. It's as delusional as being objective. And so if normal is not a thing, how can we now create systems that work for us to, that do not per perpetuate these, these false sense of normalcy, um, but instead create systems that help everyone live their, their own best lives. And, and the way to do that is to take your, your resources, take your labor, take whatever it is you bring to the table um, and put it in service. Yeah, um, well said. Um, this next question is for you and you alone, James. Uh, it says, this is a question for James King. Is there a message you particularly want to convey to the generation coming up, high school and college age students? There is. Um, we have, for, for uh, um, the research problematizing the, the inequities in our in our social constructs and systems and structures is uh, is out there um, we we can quite clearly see the problems in front of us if we are inclined to look um, what we need are, are, are people who are invested in developing language art rhetoric systems and processes that that um, imagine a brighter future. Um, I, I think that, that the work ahead of ourselves is to create language and to create a vision for what's to come. I, I encourage um, education to start to look at itself. I, I think that the um, notions of teacher and student are, are reductive and, and outdated. Um, that, that teachers go into classrooms all of the time and learn. Students go in all of the time and, and impart knowledge. And, and these are community spaces in which at various times, everyone is teaching, everyone is learning. And so start to look at the, the, the structures within education and how it perpetuates these false stratifications and hierarchies that are reducing people to roles that are, are um, minimizing their, their ability to contribute and, and um, start to, to um, above all things, recognize and realize that the systems and structures, we, structures that we are talking about um, are comprised of people. And, and, and just as people have created and perpetuated what we have now, people can change them. 
and people can dismantle them and people can create new ones and to be a part of that change. Well said again. Um, we're talking about school educators and students. So I'm gonna read another related uh, question from a teacher asking for the students. It says, uh, can you talk about the affordances and limitations of the pipeline? Uh, I assume they're talking about the school to prison pipeline as a metaphor for the interlocking systems of schools and prisons. Uh, this person is asking for their grad students who are here and our future teachers. Hello, grad students. Um, yeah, I mean, um, as far as the affordances, I mean, metaphors are useful. And I think that it to convey the intentionality of uh, an intentional construction that's like uh, exerting a pressure for kids to uh, later become incarcerated uh, can be helpful. Um, I think uh, limitations include um, the fact that like pipelines what happens within a pipe is pretty divorced from agency. Uh, we can get the impression that like this shit happens to be happening. Like it's like, it's like a force without actors, right? Like the actors are like from days of yore who like created the original institutions of the United States that, you know, privileged white people. And then today we're just kind of stuck with them rather than that, like every day today, people are making decisions to uphold white supremacy. Every day people, are making decisions to throw away our children. Every day people are making decisions about how do we control uh, non-white populations. Uh, so I feel like that's one of the limitations. I think that the biggest limitation is kind, it feels like uh, localizing the problem of racial oppression in schools rather than the full accountability of a society saying that like this entire, every institution in this society is impacted and affected by um, white supremacist architecture. Um, school is one of them, um, but everything exerts a force for people of color to fail in the United States of America. What I would add to that is when we think about the metaphor of a pipeline, things that travel through pipelines are inanimate objects. And so very subtly, this pipeline metaphor um, hides the agency of people who are in our schools and people who are in our prisons. Um, and, and I do want to highlight that the people in our prisons um, have agency. Um, Emil earlier, talked about both he and I organizing from inside prison. And I can say that a large part of my organizing in prison was just trying to convince my peers and trying to accept for myself that we had agency um, and, and that the ability to, to think critically for ourselves and direct our own actions. There would be consequences, but we had that, that agency and ability and so a pipeline, and when we think about a pipeline um, and we rely upon that, that metaphor too uncritically, it might prevent us from seeking the, the leadership of currently incarcerated people. Um, so so I, that would be one of the initial limitations that, that I would very much want to highlight. The second thing that, that I, would, I would say in the limitations of a, of a school to prison pipeline is, um, it overemphasizes the role of, of schooling in um, how we have developed a, 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 this system of, of mass incarceration. Um, there isn't a school to prison pipeline. Um, there's a, a community to prison pipeline. Uh, and, and that community to prison pipeline comes from um, all of the interlocking systems that are, are complicit in um, creating an illusion of a lack of agency where people believe through limited options um, that um, 
that that prison becomes an inevitable choice. Uh, um, and, and what I mean by that is, you know, um, when you do not know that you can challenge the 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 notion, and, and here's something that I've seen in the last two years that I have thought is has been amazing. Um, I'm new to the Bay. And upon arriving in the Bay, I was quite shocked to see all of the, the, um, the encampments of, of um, unsheltered people. And I remember in watching the, the Moms for Housing organizing, learning that you had developers who were buying houses and then refusing to rent them out in order to drive the property value up to make their their property more equitable. Um, and so a person dealing with the trauma and pain of poverty and houselessness perhaps acts out of that poverty and, and, and pain and commits an act that, that our laws deem to be criminal. Um, when that happens, when that occurs, um, it wasn't a, a it was not a a, a pipeline. Um, it certainly wasn't a school to prison pipeline. Um, it was instead a a, a um, community that either through through uh, unawareness, through lack of engagement, or through active perpetuation and complicity created an environment and created laws that led to the, the notion of this, this criminal. And, and one thing um, that I would add to that is um, when we talk about getting away from the language of teachers and students and, and such reductive labels, we also need to get away from such harmful ideas as crime and criminal. Um, those are moral, moral terms and language that, that are, are creating more harm than, than good in our society. Um, my favorite example that many people have heard me give on, on numerous occasions is we live in a society where it, it's, it's um, lawful, it, it, it's illegal to, to go steal a bottle of aspirin, but it's lawful to deny someone health care. Um, and, and so our whole notion of crime is subjective. Our laws are subjective. They are designed to, to, to promote a status quo. Uh, um, and therefore, and if that's the case, then the criminal is subjective as well. Um, there are acts, it, as I alluded to early, that are the exact same act, whether it's separating a, a, a child from a parent, that in some context we deem it criminal, in others we lift it up and consider it noble and necessary good for protection of some border that someone thought about in their mind. So um, I do think that, that ultimately um, we should understand metaphor for what it is, which is always reductive. It always hides more than it, it, it reveals. So we always need to make sure we are creating conflicting metaphors that present a more full picture of, in order to help us conceptualize a bigger and brighter future and way of being. Uh, before we move to the next question, I have to focus you a little bit, James. As a writer, I must object to your characterization of metaphors. <laughs> um, they're very important. Um, but yeah, but but I think that what you're pointing out is once metaphors become a part of the common language, we tend to lose the power that the metaphor was excavated and we flatten it um, and, and, and we lose the benefit that it was trying to give us in making us think about a thing because we stop thinking about it. We just let the, we let, we let the, the metaphor do our work for us. Um, and I think that's true. So this next question is what I call an oh shit question. Um, because of its importance and um, and it's uh, can you talk about ways communities of color can begin to insulate themselves divest from oppressive systems um, I'm gonna name that that is a big question which uh, 
I feel a bit of trepidation about answering, but I'm gonna give it a go, right? Um, so the short answer is we have to uh, create new systems and we have to create new cultures for ourselves. Um, what I mean by that is, um, requires a little context setting. So like if we think about, um, I think communities of color has to have to ask themselves the honest question and like be in this very scary space of, is what I call my culture actually my culture? Because there's a way in which like in my community, like we do a lot of things and we're like, man, this is how we do things, right? And where we're like, this is our culture, right? This is black culture. Uh, like homophobia is often like uh, characterizes like, man, this is how we do it in the hood. Or like, this is what I learned in church. This is my culture. You're trying to take my culture away from me. Um, and I think that we got to really examine that. And the, and the thing that I would like people to think about uh, if you identify as a person of color when you're examining that is, is, is a couple of things. First thing is we can all agree that whiteness is a construction. Whiteness was a construction and the furtherance of white supremacy. We all know that, we've all been taught that if we are um, studying the politics of colonialism. What we often don't talk about is the flip side of that coin. If whiteness is a construction in the furtherance of white supremacy, then how can blackness be anything else but the same? So that's just the other side of that same created coin. If whiteness was created to elevate white people and white privilege, then blackness was created to oppress the descendants of African slaves. So think about what that means. And it's like a scary thought. It's like, wait, like, what if the things that I have been taught are mine are not actually mine? Um, this comes back to the idea of, um, you know, colonialism was the systemic elimination of all competing ideas that competed with the idea, with the status quo of white supremacy. So I think the example that's closest to my heart is uh, like homophobia and transphobia. Uh, and you know, I did, we did this podcast, me and, me and Rasan, me in New York and Shah, and we were talking about Moonlight. Um, and, um, and, and, and eventually we talked about homophobia and eventually we talked about it being like, you know, black culture. And one of the things that like I often ask people to consider is if what you call your culture consistently divides you or separates you from the people who have the most politically in common with you, then maybe you need to question if that is actually your culture. Because who is that serving? Culture serves the people it belongs to. Like it, it evolves like organically, right? Outside, like left unfucked with, with by shit like colonialism. So if what you call your culture is consistently serving other cultures and consistently giving you a disservice, you gotta like ask yourself the question, is this really my, my culture? And that's the work I feel like people of color need to do, have to do. We one have to have a very honest conversation about um, what's ours and what's not ours. And uh, in that conversation, I believe we're gonna come to a very scary conclusion that um, that we are in the position of starting from stage zero and but what's and we have to create something else. We have to create something with the knowledge of what has been done to us, right? And like what we're gonna do about it. And maybe that means we don't have the connection to the deep rooted sense of history that we crave. But it does mean we get to create an actual culture that's ours, to get to create an actual history that's ours for our children. And we may not get to, we may not have the luxury and the blessing of having a history that's ours, but our children and our grandchildren can, but we can only do that if we own this very scary thing and start building from it. 
So I think that um, that's the way we divest from these oppressive systems, many of which we've internalized, because um, we got to own that scary truth and we got to start building something new and we got to build something that's going to liberate our children rather than something that's going to keep them in the same cycles of oppression. You know, I, I, I'd add to that, that Dyke. Um, divestment and, and insulation both create their own sets of challenges and, and are, are um, different options for pathways. And, and when it comes to divestment, I honestly don't know. Like you can, and, and this has happened in history of this world, you can say, you know what, I'm going to opt out of, of America and capitalism and go start my own country or, or, or revolt against the leadership, be it Liberia or Haiti, and you will find the world organize against you. This is a, this is a, a global uh, um, crisis and, and system of oppression. And, and um, so it's hard to know how to divest from something so, so global. I do think that there are, are, are that, and that's not to say that they don't exist. I just do not know what the pathways are. Um, when it comes to insulation though, I, I think that, that the beginning of insulation is first to, to name the systems, to name the capitalism, to, to name the heteropatriarchy, to name the white supremacy, to name all of the interlocking systems and structures that are, are um, working together in order to, to um, create this world that we, we have now. And then after naming them, which we are all, I think, or, or many of us are in the process of doing, then to, to begin to think of counters to those systems. So if the larger society is in, is in a capitalistic, individual, rugged type society, we'll form a more communal one. We'll use a shared economy. Uh, um, and start to look at ways to not be complicit with capitalism. Uh, we will barter. And, and I think that that um, amazing thing about, about prison is, um, for instance, West Block at San Quentin, there are over 800 people in that building. Maybe maybe 150 have, have good family support. Maybe another 100 are, are, are working jobs, maybe hundred others have a, have a hustle that sees them through the month, from month to month. And they come together and they hold spread and they, they share. And, and I can go to Emil's door and say, hey man, I, I need a um, bag of rice um, and, a, and a pack of tuna. And, and he'll say, well, you, it sounds like you're about to do something. I have some shells and we'll come together and, and we'll create a meal where, where um, before, all we had were the pieces of a meal. And, and so, or, or, or pieces that could, if we came together, become part of a meal. So that's just one, one idea for what insulation can look like. I, I, I think that, that when it comes to insulating ourselves from these systems which are oppressing us, what it's what's a good practice is to see what those who are most directly impacted are doing and then formalize those structures and shine those structures up and improve upon those structures. Because in the more directly impacted aspects of our community, people have workarounds. People have figured out ways to survive in spite of the, the systems that are, are might, be, might have gotten there uh, um, without being named, that this is a system, but to start to look and just look at the patterns and systems around us that we are already using and then think about how to formalize those, flex those, those structures by naming them, but also retaining the flexibility to let them evolve and grow. Um, I'll pause there. Nice. Um... We have, I think about 30 minutes um, left. And I wanna read this, this, this from an anonymous attendee, uh, not because I have an answer, but because I think it's, it's important to give it voice. Um, so it says, 
can you please speak a little about First Nations people in prison and in your country and how they can be acknowledged, recognized as the traditional owners of the land and therefore leaders in the deconstruction of white supremacy there? Um, I will, I will, oh, excuse me, we have eight minutes. <laughs> So we're gonna answer that question in eight minutes. Um, so here's my thing. I don't know a lot about um, the contemporary struggles of First Nation people. Um, and I don't think, I won't speak for other people, but I get the impression that like not many people do. But I think that this is a really great example of how well intentioned or not, that we internalize, we can internalize white supremacy. We can practice white supremacy in the name of dismantling white supremacy. Because absolutely what we're doing when we're talking about uh, incarceration and racial oppression is uh, that uh, by and large uh, disproportionate effects of black people, we're talking about dismantling white supremacy. But here's a couple of things I know about First Nations people. One, their incarceration rates uh, comparable, if not more extreme than uh, Black, than African American people. Um, uh, and, uh, but when we hear about um, narratives of like social justice, uh, we very, we, we, outside of the Bay Area, you, you, like the, the Bay Area is like deep in the practice of acknowledging that we are like standing on the lands of Native people, uh, the Ohlone people in the case, if you're, if you're standing in Oakland right now. Um, but for the most part, that's not really a part of the national narrative. Uh, and when I organize, it's not really part of my narrative either. It's not something that is really on my radar uh, in the way that uh, it should be considering that like I'm standing on their land. Uh, now I didn't get here willingly, uh, but there is a deep history of shocking genocide and land displacement that is the very foundation of everything we call freedom. Um, and so I just wanna give that question air. I don't have a good an answer for you. I don't know a lot about First Nations people. Uh, and that is uh, my own failing. And that is also uh, a part of the struggle in developing the imagination that actually um, redistribute power in ways that are just. I think the only thing, I, I mean, I share a lot of, of what Emil just said. And, and, and the one thing that I would add to that is um, First Nation people have a lot that they can um, teach about um, constructing a more just an equitable society. I, I, um, I have a First Nation friend who's taught me a lot ab about this in various ways and means. Um, I do think that, that largely, largely the burden for dismantling the system of white supremacy falls to white people. Um, I, I think that it is their labor, it is their, um, their cross to bear, um, especially um, because of the way our, our society is currently constructed, they um, are often in the positions of, of institutionalized power that will allow them to dismantle systems of oppression. Um, I would encourage them to do it at the direction of um, First Nation people, Black people, um, other uh, people of color. I think that, that they need to take the lead. Um, but I, I, I think that, or in direction from, from these marginalized, currently marginalized sectors of our society. But, um, but I think that um, First Nation people, Black people in, in all sectors of our society that are currently marginalized or disenfranchised now, um, get to choose to opt in or, or, or opt out of leading that work. Um, I, I'll, uh, um, 
one of my, my very favorite things that I've learned from Emil actually is, is um, as he was coming home, um, he said, you know what, I'm going to take my first month and all I'm going to do is just heal. Uh, um, I'm going to set that time aside. I'm not going to be reaching out to people. I'm not going to, to um, be taking on tasks, assignments, work, this, that, or the other. I want to heal from the violence of, of incarceration. Not saying it will take that, like it will, I'll be done at that point, but that's what that first month is about. And then we'll reconvene and, and consider like options and healing after that. And, and I think that that applies to, to um, we can look at that in a larger scope and think about um, what are ways that, that um, First Nation people can heal um, from, um, from this as well and how can we um, contribute to that healing. So two minutes left, I'm not going to try to field another question. Um, James, thank you so much for uh, appearing today and sharing your wisdom. Um, uh, I love and respect you deeply. And uh, I tell people behind your back all the time that uh, you are my hero and you are what the movement needs. Um, so thank you for showing up and, and thank you for your work. You know, I, I, I thank you for the for those kind words. Um, I, I just uh, um, appreciate you deeply. Um, your leadership, um, your mentorship in, in, in so many ways, though you're a little younger than I am physically, you are just um, so extremely brilliant and wise that and, and that um, love being in community with you and, and uh, um, we should take this conversation offline. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Um, uh, th there's lots of links in the chat. You can check stuff out. Uh, please support the work that James is doing uh, and support the work that the Ella Baker Center is doing. I can say from personal experience, I've watched this organization grow and the way that they embody the principles that are going to uh, the people who are doing the work to create an organization that uh, can feel proud about uh, the way we do this work uh, is quite inspiring and quite impressive. Uh, and we all have a lot of work to do and a lot more imagination to build. Uh, but um, I do, I am, I am proud of the example of like the people I know at the Ella Baker Center and how they're doing this work. Um, so please, please support that organization. Um, good night.